Hi, I'm Ralph Preston. It's Tuesday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, and guess what we're doing? We're having another Stroke Buddies Stroke Survivor Support Group meeting. And today, we've got um, somebody who I've met recently who I find uh, very interesting, uh, David Desero, who's a um, physical therapist who, like the rest of us, unfortunately suffered a stroke. I believe he was 39 and it was 16 years ago. Don't meet too many people. I'm 14 years out. I don't meet too many people who are further out than me, but there are some. And uh, so David has a very interesting story. Briefly, he uh, was a marathoner. He's done marathons uh, post-stroke. And, but more importantly, he returned to his physical therapy practice because I probably believe, I'm just getting to know him, but I bet that was real important to him to get back to that physical therapy um, uh, practice. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce David. And first thing I wanted to talk to you about, David, was, um, you know, People who become nutritionists and physical therapists and such uh, have some empathy. They're, these are careers where you help other people. So can you talk a little bit about um, being empathetic and why you got into being a nutritionist and a PT? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Ralph, for, for having me today to share my story and to meet folks in your community as well. And a great question to start. Yeah. Um, I, um, I, when I, I, I've had a long he, uh, history in healthcare now, um, prior to becoming a PT, you mentioned nutrition and that was my foundation. Um, uh, I, I knew that it was something that, um, you know, growing up as, as an athlete, uh, you know, in, in high school and then and beyond in college, I knew the importance of fueling for sport. And, and that really piqued my interest around, um, diving into learning about how nutrition can fuel performance. And so my undergraduate degree uh, was in nutrition and dietetics. I practiced for, uh, for about seven years as a registered dietitian in an outside of the hospital setting. And I also had my own private practice, um, had my exercise science background along with that. Uh, um, but yeah, um, that was the fuel that motivated me was just seeing, seeing the transformational change you can make by introducing, uh, behavior change, uh, early on before, um, it, it, it's it, the importance of it was, was seen in a lot of ways. We're still, we still fight that with, you know, uh, paying for prevention. But, um, at the time there wasn't, um, a, a PT program in my area. And I always knew I was limited in some of the things that, um, that I could do with my scope of practice, even though I was doing a lot on exercise. Um, I eventually went back to become a physical therapist. And, and if it's, you know, within that, that allowed me to, to work deeper with individuals. And I, prior to my stroke, I did treat the spectrum. I wasn't a neuro trained physical therapist. I was an orthopedist with a sport background. Um, but that motivation or that, I guess you don't go into the healing professions without having empathy and wanting to, you know, you don't, <laughs> I would say most of us don't go into it because we know we're going to make a lot of money. Um, we go into it because we want to do the best for the most amount of people and, um, you know, come home at the end of the day, knowing that we had an impact, um, that served me well moving six years in, after, um, after uh, working in a number of different inpatient, outpatient facilities, starting my own practice, and then shortly after that, um, woke up to a stroke. Um, do you think that you're, I don't want to get, go too far down this road, but do you feel like your stroke um, made you more empathetic as a person? I, I, I feel like mine did, it made me more empathetic. I'm, I'm curious, this is another uh, question I ask people that are, I think are, are empathetic, the effects of a stroke. Oh, ab absolutely, uh, Ralph. You'd, you know, I, I, I would see folks for that short period of time in the clinic and didn't realize what they dealt with when they went home. 
you really, you know, we have these episodes of care and these short term experiences with most uh, patients we treat, but having to lived on the other side and seen, especially in stroke, all the barriers to care and the services and the, you know, the, the, the silos as they use uh, to talk about in healthcare. Um, I, I, I really feel like it changed now the way I practice today for a while. Um, I didn't think I would be able to return to practice. Um, my deficits and every, you know, one thing we know about stroke is no two are the same. And everyone, we talked a little before we started uh, this meeting about, um, you know, do you feel you're, you're fully recovered? Well, we'll you know, folks look at all of us differently and maybe make impressions based on what they see or what they don't see. I'll tell you, I am fully recovered and I have to work at it still every day, some 16 years later. Maybe I'm in maintenance mode now, but when when the when that mountain was in front of me and I, you know, um, I can just say that there's never an ideal time for this to happen, right? So I had, I had, <laughs> there never is. And that's that's what makes this unlike many conditions, one day you're here, the next day you're here, right? And you, everything about your life changes like that. And for me, um, you know, 16 years later, I, I'll, I'll tell my story on a stage or something like this. And I still feel myself getting a little, you know, a little tightened up here because, you know, I, I, I had my wife and I had three children under the age of eight years old, um, not long into my private practice. And then life just, you know, my, 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 yeah, uh, my diagnosis was um, not clear right away in terms of what caused my stroke. And a lot of my advocacy later on, you said having empathy. Um, I, you know, uh, my stroke was, it was determined that it was caused from a congenital heart defect. And there might be folks in your community. And I have heard you mention the term PFO. We all have different risk factors. This was something that I, I went 30, 39 years um, not knowing that um, I had, there was, there was one, one warning sign and to today in my advocacy, I can, I can speak to, 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 to sort of the, the path to my recovery, but there was one big warning sign I mentioned to you via email that um, resonates with me. It's worth noting um, about knowing the warning signs because I, I was, I, I mentioned I had an athletic background. I was, I was, um, in between seasons for my senior year in hockey and I was getting ready to run a drill and I dropped to the ice just like that. And I lost the entire left side of my body. I couldn't stand up. I couldn't speak. My face was drooping. I, my, I'm a left-handed shot. My, my stick dropped out of my hand and I, and I slid myself back to the boards and I can remember like it happened yesterday. And I was having a TIA. I was having a big event that a coach who did not know the warning signs came around to the side. He was watching drill from off the ice, came around to the boards, looked down at me and said, by then I had started to get some return. My friend was next to me. He, I couldn't speak to him. I, I, I was able to get almost complete return from that period of time. And he told me, just shake it off. That's a pinched nerve that happens to hockey players. We were approaching a big season. I was a captain senior year, never mentioned that until it came up when they were looking at my brain after my other stroke at 39. And they said, you have an old lesion affecting this and it definitely would have affected the left side, but it, it, you know, that's just how the brain is wired. And we don't, you know, I, I, I went um, through my recovery at a time when we didn't have telehealth. We didn't have um, a lot of other tools. And, and I'm happy to talk to kind of what motivated me to go. We mentioned wanted to talk a little bit about digital and where the future might be with rehab. We didn't have those tools. We had, you know, because I was home after, after a short period, I knew that my recovery would be best served in my home. And if you, you know, folks listening, you, you commented, Ralph, my, the background here is real. <laughs> This is my telehealth now studio, but a lot of the same equipment. I actually, um, I, I wanna say 
for many, I did sell three have because I didn't want, there weren't, there weren't um, good resources and still aren't today to explain stroke to a young person. And I didn't want to scare my wife and I did not want to scare our children. So while I was waiting and it took almost a year for me to go on the path to eventually have my heart, I had to have heart surgery to have my PFO closed. Um, I did a lot of rehab, but the best advice I had was imagine this, stop practicing. You can't lift more than eight pounds or you'll probably have another stroke because you have a big shunting hole in your heart. It's, it's going to be um, sending a lot of junk up to your brain and don't pick up your kids because that's more than eight pounds. Right. So I had a three-year-old at the time who just looked at me and said, dad, when you feel better, can you pick me up? And, um, if you need more motive, if you need more motivation than that, um, that led me on a path. And I've heard you speak, Ralph, to, to, to how much time do you have to invest in your recovery as much as long as it takes. Like I was all in. I can tell you that I, I, if, if, I, if I was lucky to have a stroke at any point in my life, I had six years of training as a PT. I knew the terms neuroplasticity, how that works, how volume-based work. I knew that. And I convey this today to a lot of the um, survivors I work with is that you almost have to train in a mindset like you're an athlete. Even if you've never picked up a baseball bat or tied a pair of shoes on, you have to drive change and it, it can start small. It can be transferring sit to stand as an athlete. It can be building the foundation as an athlete, which also includes going back to some of my early training, nutrition and supporting your movement and mobility. Um, but that's kind of like my, my training and a lot of the tools, when I say I did a lot of stealth recovery, I introduced play, um, to recovery. And at the time my, my children were, I can show you today because they're still right in my clinic. A lot of, a lot of folks don't even this, 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 uh, simple Wii board was one of my best remote assessment tools. At the time, that was the big game for my kids. It was Wii Sports and the balance games that the, the, Wii, the, Wii, the Wii sensor actually that are integrated are very accurate. And they could tell me my, my deficits were on my left, my left side. And I, I was able to do a lot of my biofeedback and the things and the technologies and digital now that are, that, that are here and now but just haven't got to patients were things that I kind of hacked early on, like knowing day to day, because I was working remotely, I'd get some of my therapist friends on a call and I'd say, look at how I'm doing this. Am I missing anything? Can I do this? I would introduce like the swing set for me um, became one of my best balance tools because I could be, I could be doing, I could be doing my balance exercises behind my youngest child, and I could be also introducing time with him where he didn't know I was I was I was working at recovery. Um, but you know, there were a lot of things that I just uh, you know I I I hacked and put together to put in the time that was needed to impact or achieve the goals I wanted. My goals were initially very small. They were, you know. Um, <laughs> I'll be, I'll be completely open. It was, it was to be able to stand up and pee without falling over or be able to stand up and, and, and pee and not have to pee sitting down. Like I, I hate <laughs> mentioning that, but you no, know, no, small, simple, true. you know, um, to, to be able to get up at night and not have my foot dragging so much that it would wake my wife up because she was the superhero that was doing double shifts and happened to be a nurse. So she, it was good and bad because when she was working her shifts, we joke now, but she would, she would be calling in to make sure I was okay. And I wasn't having another event and behind the scenes, she was certainly probably concerned at the same time, but wouldn't admit it that she was concerned that if something happened to me, I was home alone with our three children, you know, um, but 
that was kind of my path. It wasn't, you know, it was certainly something that if I didn't have my background in training and the tools, I would not have been able to, um, to, to do that. And that's, you know, going back to the empathy point, that that's what makes me so motivated to work now at the, at the advocacy that I'm doing along with my co-founder at no stroke to bring those resources and, and call attention to this need. And you, you know, you, you, you've mentioned telling your story. I think we, we have a lot of parallels that, you know, it's going to take, um, I think you mentioned at the end of your bio too, that I think Brian Harris from Med Rhythms mentions it takes, how do you move an elephant, right? You just, keep you just keep pushing, you keep pushing. So um, I'm keeping pushing and I know you're doing the same. A couple things real quick. Um, I think I've noticed that athletes uh, tend to do better in stroke recovery. Now, I think a small part of that might have to do with the fact of uh, their athleticism. The fact that they're in good shape might help them in, in, uh, in terms of what they suffered uh, uh, in a stroke. I know nothing about that, so I'm not going to talk about it, but uh, also in their, in their recovery. And, but the main thing, I think, uh, with athletes is they already understand the whole thing about um, training and working for goals. And they understand that you don't say today, you don't set a goal, no matter how small today, and wake up tomorrow and achieve it. You know, there takes some period of time. So they're, they're used yeah. to, like, working for things in the, in the future. And I think that uh, really serves them well because the average person who has a stroke who hasn't trained for any type of athletic event doesn't have um, that that kind of mindset. Um, yeah, yeah, really well said, Ralph. I'll just add to the other part that I, I personally I love when the Olympics come around. Always so many years because I always call on the examples. Not too many, not as many people. It's not as big a deal as it used to be. But when the Olympics came on, when I was growing up, everyone got around the set and watched. But uh, but when 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 we you still do. And, and so what I, what I convey to my, to my clients is I say, look at what they're doing, even when they're, you know, so you hear the stories about how they, what, what it took to get there. And then when they say it, but when they're ready to perform and before they're ready to perform and especially if they're doing complex canoes, what are they doing? They're practicing that mental imagery. You see a diver on the sideline before they're going through their form to actually they're doing that on dry land and their eyes are closed and they're bringing in the power of, of that mental, like if you can see it in your brain, you can believe it and you can see it. And I, and I, I always draw from that and I say, you know, and, and plus I, I mentioned in, earlier where you talk about the foundation of the nutrition, you just don't get there without maximizing all, all those other areas, your brain health, but your fuel that you're performing in that sport. To, to achieve at the highest. And I feel that's a big missing for me. That's a big missing part of the stroke rehab equation. I, I know you've, you've talked about it. Um, like we treat cardiac rehab one way and we, 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 we have a more formal plan that looks at all the lifestyle components. Yet if you have a stroke and you have similar risk factors, go home and figure it out. Right. Like, don't even talk about, don't talk to me about re nutrition. I don't have time. And, 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 and or it doesn't really play a role. Well, if your biggest, biggest, uh, your biggest pill you can swallow is exercise, right? After a stroke. And with that, you need to maximize all those other areas that will allow you to exercise. And one of it is properly fueling, you know, hydration, but also, so yeah, if, and if you use that, that analogy of why maybe some stroke survivors have better return. They, they do have, they do have a, a, maybe a better awareness of how their, their body moves in space and what, what muscles should be on to perform, but that still can be taught and it can be taught after, after a stroke as well. And it starts like baby steps and short goals and knowing where you are and what meaningful goals are there. Um, uh, you know, whether it be like I said, walking someone down the aisle, um, you could be, you know, a, a parent's goal to see to be able to lift your kid absolutely is so impacting. Like for me, I was like, um, and and I'll t I'll tell you one if I if I could. I don't want to get off. I'll no, tell no, you no. I'll tell you one I'll tell you one story related to that. 
that um, <laughs> didn't, I didn't think it resonated as much with my youngest son until he reflected on this for his, he's now just, he just graduated as a senior and he's reflecting this on his senior thesis. There was one moment where um, I was, I was, I had just had my closure. I had got some of my return back, but I still, um, I had just returned to driving and I still didn't feel like I definitely, I wasn't able to treat because my left guiding arm, like I mentioned, you would know if you worked with me at the end of the day, um, I just didn't have the strength. I didn't have the fine motor control and I felt first do no harm. I thought I would maybe do something wrong working with a patient, but we were in in our backyard, I hadn't yet gone to the point where I, I felt confident working with my body like I had before and returning to practice. And I'm, if you picture this, I had all three of my kids. My wife was working. I had big, big shepherd dog sitting. We're cooking marshmallows out in the back. And my son will recount this better. And I'm actually going to see if he'll if allow me to leave his story in a book I'm working on because for me, it was impactful. He turned, I was trying to make marshmallows. And he thought it would, he would be wise when dad turned around. He was a real sweet kid. He loves the sweets. He grabbed a couple extra marshmallows and, and stuffed them in before I had got the s'mores ready. And I turned around to see him choking. And he was, I said, he looked like a seagull. And he was doing this and his face, his color was changing and he couldn't breathe. And, you know, I think I harnessed all the power in my being. Um, this is not the way you're supposed to do the Heimlich, but talk to the point about picking him up. I grabbed him. I flipped him upside down and I held him here and I whacked him with my better arm <laughs> and dislodged the, the, um, the um, excuse me, the marshmallows. And I still, we all think it was comical because he was fine, scared and meaningful enough to him that he writes about it as something to talk about um, as a young adult. But all I remember is my dog immediately running over and grabbing <laughs> the marshmallows and eating them. But we, so you can imagine how that conversation went that night when my wife got home and she said, how was your day? How were the kids? And I said, well, um, save Jared's life. And other than that, it was a great day. <laughs> so that to me was a, a pivotal turning point for me too, because it showed that I had restored my, my, my abilities as a dad physically too, as well as, um, um, you know, I wasn't always, you know, we all go through phases and there's silent areas and areas that, you know, we can go to dark places when we're initially, feel like we're alone and and we're not going to get to our ultimate goal so for me that was a big win yeah I know about those little turning points we we all have them you have to relish in them um yeah uh I'm curious if uh, to talk to you a little bit about how being a physical therapist impacted your recovery did it help you or hinder you or just um well, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about uh, yeah. being a PT, having some knowledge and then having to um, apply it to yourself, basically. Yeah, no, no, great, great, great question. And, and um, yeah, it, it definitely um, made me dive a lot deeper into the questions I asked um, to go a little bit deeper into what really what are those barriers once you get home? We have this short episode of care, you know, insurance is certainly not helping with that. And we have to do the best in the shortest amount of time. Yeah, cheers, right? And we need to change that because this is not something, we, su we support other conditions for the long term, right? right? Like it, it, if someone, you know, a, a newly diagnosed diabetic, we provide the education and the training. We also... In other areas, um, we do a much better job. In, in PT, when I would see someone, and I had some, my first job as a PT, I had a cute, I, I was like the utility player in my first job. I worked at a, a hospital where I did inpatient, I did outpatient um, peds, and I did inpatient neuro. Um, they had a, 
they had a, a, an acute recovery floor and then they had a sub subacute care for most most patients that had had strokes and 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 um, or were there for elective uh, procedures for joints. But I would not. I would not ask him those questions about what barriers do you have, what ops do you have when you get home. And, and I and I would now I drill down to what's your true why? What, what you know? What's your motivation to get here? Where? What? What is? You know? I would I. I would find out like where they're starting. You know, and you mentioned the athlete. Not everyone's coming in having the foundation that I had. Um, I was active. Um, I knew what it would feel like to get my heart rate up. For some people, getting your heart rate up that first time might feel the increased respiration. And, you know, if there was an insult to the brain that they feel like I'm going to have something like so explaining um, and educating. And later on, um, I started really like one one. And, you know, you see behind me. Um, I, I talk in, in you know, um, to, to other support groups and I mentioned like my goal started small. Um, I certainly didn't start running. I walked and I walked measuring telephone poles and I walked with my child's double wide stroller because I, I wanted to try to hide the fact that I fell a lot and I, and I waited that stroller and I would wait. I was the one that got them on the bus and I would wait till all the other parents left and the bus had gone to turn and make my way around because I could go straight, I could back up, but turning and that presented issues for me. So I would wait till the coast was clear and I would make my way. But the training happened where telephone poles became, I called it running. It really, it was running with the aid of the, 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 the an assist there. Um, but, you know, then eventually that became miles, but that took, time and one of the ways you see behind is that I was able I knew I knew the high-tech tools that we had like if you went to Spalding or you went to a neural floor where you had the latest and greatest tools and I knew what I needed was something to make me go faster but give me the support and I know a de-weighting harness is very expensive and when I say I hacked my own recovery um, I used the same system you see here, and I and I got a I'm still in a box here. Um, I could pull it out, but I I knew the, the harness systems were very expensive, so I ordered a safety harness that construction workers would wear when they are working on a roof. It's much less expensive than what you would buy from a neuro clinic, and and as long as you could hook up three points of contact, so you. It would break a fall, but it would also stop you from spinning. So I did a lot of my return um, to a faster pace walking by harnessing myself to give me those safeties. And I know I mentioned, I know you mentioned like when you walked, you would move to the grass because you knew where you were going to fall, right? It was just going to happen. Um, I knew if I wanted to pick up my pace or make it more automatic. So when I, you know, it's a long way of saying I applied a lot of those same tools into hacking recovery or giving um, patients more options that they could take some of their training time into the home and give them ideas that they could work. Um, you know, I did a lot of my work with the TRX system, but I'll just show you one, one of the simple, those are expensive, right? And a lot of clinics are using them. When I refer to the TRX, it's the total body resistance. You can use it to transition. Yeah. So um, a lot of folks don't have an extra couple of hundred dollars, but they could probably get something like this, which I don't know if you recognize this, but this is a moving dolly strap, right? And I know it's weighted heavy. So I feel for eight to $12, if someone wants to do balance work and they have a way to anchor this or put it in the system, they can actually use tools like this. So like when I say, you know, hack or, or I use the term it gives my age away I say MacGyver we MacGyver a lot of things to I would find myself after my stroke going the extra mile for patients to make sure they were set up for success in their home because I used to say it was 80 20 where 20 percent of the hard work happens in the clinic 80 percent has to happen at home now I want to say unfortunately it's like 
5% actually happens if you have, depending on your zip code and where you actually have your event and what support you have. The rest, 95% of that has to happen. You have to own it and, 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 and having community. And I'll speak to the power of the short time that I became aware of the work that you're doing, Ralph. The videos and the things you're doing are phenomenal. And that's, that's, I started working with companies that were, you know, I don't want to shift gears to digital unless you want to, but they were actually doing the best work to give clinicians, PTs and OTs the tools so that they could also set their clients, especially survivors up for the best outcomes at home, you know, set them. And it doesn't mean you have to have high tech, high touch tools can work very well, but it's the accountability and the um, where the high tech comes in is to know if you are working towards a goal. And, you know, for me, it was the wee board when I went to do my sit to stand when, when I, when I, and I, I can joke about this now, but when I, when I first started doing wee sports, I couldn't stand in a squat and hold my weight. I would fall to the left to do, if anyone knows the game, there's a ski jump game talking about Olympics. And I would, I would fall and topple. And meanwhile, my three and five year olds are holding perfect form launching themselves and going 275 meters on Wii Sports and dad's rolling after 14 meters. <laughs> so, but over time, dad could start jumping over a hundred and then dad was trying to keep up, never got to where they were, but they always came away with the digital gold medal. But that's where I knew I was making progress because I knew I couldn't even I, I couldn't even hold my balance long enough to be able to actually execute that one maneuver once. So, when, when you got the, um, I, it's interesting. Um, well, I've had the same idea about getting an OSHA vest for forty bucks from a big box store uh, because it's the same three points. You know, you don't. Yeah. There's so many people that get um, stumped. Um, and I, I'm glad to hear, I, I kind of figured you'd probably be an adapter. That's what I call myself. <laughs> in fact, actually, I'm gonna, we're going to, in three weeks, we're going to do a program. Uh, Lisa Piano and I was an OT. We're going to do a program on adapting because it's a real, it's a real skill. If you have yeah. to do 80 to 95% of it at home, I loved hearing you say that because I'm a big believer that the PT is like a piano teacher. And if you don't go home and practice, you don't get better. Um, Absolutely. So what did you hook that OSHA vest to? Yeah, I'll show you. Actually, I have it in the box here. My uh, uh, Just because I think it would be helpful for your folks to see. Um, I'm actually considering building a – basically, I designed something out of something called speed rail. It's the stuff that you see on warehouse loading docks, like the railing that you grab onto. They make all kinds of parts. Yeah. I designed a thing like 30 feet long with a track in it. You basically use a sliding door track from Home Depot or wherever. Absolutely. Yeah, so you're one half step ahead. You're adding in that linear part. I did everything in a – but just so for folks see, and I'll answer your question what I connected it with. Um, this is the safety harness. It's a, you definitely want a three-point, but this – you know, now, now, back in the day, I had to do the long way to find – um, this, but now you could get this in two days on Amazon, and this vest is probably thirty-nine dollars if you put it in your cart and let it go on sale. And it's rated, but the key is that you mentioned it. You have to have the three points, um, and you may need help because depending on how you're able, you do have to be able to get the clasp. So initially, you may need assist. And um, the, so what I anchored it to my center point, which was taking my my biggest load, and I don't I don't have it in here now um, because I transformed it into a harness. <laughs> Talking about MacGyvering for my dog in his car in our car, um, but the belay and I could certainly show you the belay straps in mountain climbing. They're closed loops. They're great for actually stretching out too, um, self stretching. But they're rated enough that they could break a fall if you if you if your belay your main belay went. So it's just a, I, I I have it put together in a hacked list. I'm glad to send you the whole kit over and all the links because I would use that for my center. And then what I would do on the sides, and this is also very cheap, 
I like uh, I like going into Harbor Freight. I don't know if you you have them where you are or any there oh, or yeah. you um, <laughs> um, any of the tie down straps um, for your vehicle or for securing. Um, they have a hook, but I replaced the hook with a mountain climber belay clip. So picture you're standing. I'll bring this up just so you can see. You'd have a center strap taking the bulk of your load and you could you could actually tighten that or make this this only this would only need to be heavy enough that if you did fall and I have a video on YouTube where I actually I'm walking fast and just drop to show the system just holding me. But the two the, the, the key part on the two sides is that once once you hook the center up with the clip, the two sides come in, you can clip them but then you can tension them as you need them because they they have that quick little um, thumb zip zip tensioner, you know, so you push here and it, and it would lock down. So you can get in with it slack and then before you start to walk or practice your balance exercise, you can zip up the sides so it's nice and snug and you have the confidence that um, if you need to take a break, um, you can, you could have it slack enough that if you needed to take a break, you could pause. And I actually, when I would, would have to take a break, I'd bring a chair over and sit down for a while. And then, and, you know, so you can loosen it enough that you could grab something, but the main, the main point of it is definitely, you know, get that, that three, it's the, the term you want to be completely, um, you know, confident is that you're getting a three point three-point harness but that's you know that's just one example of things that you know i've told folks over the years but in the clinic like you mentioned that 10 percent now and and the honest truth to it and and most pts if they heard this would would not be happy is that that takes time it takes time to get someone in and out of that system in the clinic so even though that might be the best per uh, technique to use for that period of time. Oftentimes the setup and getting someone out, if you have to bill to make that appointment um, worthwhile for the clinic <coughs> side, oftentimes the, the other side gets lost. And it's, you know, in a lot of outpatient clinics, you mentioned you're going, your system is based on that, like a linear system that a lot of the the, 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 the big, the bigger known rehab clinics will have your average mom and pop outpatient clinic in my community. I know, cause I've, I was weighing this when, when I had my stroke, no one had that. So wh when I was eventually discharged to out, I said, I want to do outpatient the way I know that I need to invest the time. I want to be with my family. I want to be doing meaningful practice, meaning if I'm going to practice getting up and down the stairs. I want those stairs to be in my home and I want to be, you know, ultimately leading to the things that I needed to do to get back to, um, you know, one of my ultimate goals I mentioned return to running. Um, I grew up playing hockey and I knew eventually um, I wanted to get back on skates. And if you think of walking on flat feet <laughs> and then walking on a blade that is yay millimeters thing, that was not an easy task. And I still, <laughs> um, but I you know, I had to mimic that practice. So initially I would stand in my rollerblade boots in my house, holding on to the counter. And I would just practice weight shifting to see what that would feel like. And I would practice doing small break down those tasks like an athlete would into what would it take to push off? What would it take? But, you know, small, small steps, but the, consistent and i think you use the term you know you got to be all in you got to be you know you got to get at it i think is the term you used in your talk that i that i listened to well yeah and i'm a big believer in breaking things down not saying if you can't do something completely then don't see it as an obstacle and give up say start you know put the analytical mind to use and start saying okay well what are the pieces of this because i can work on the pieces and then put it back together it's interesting because in my own stroke recovery i considered that cheating i hadn't learned that yet so as a guy i tried to apply what i call guy thinking you know i thought well okay <laughs> yeah you watch something 
Well, you were mentioning the lack of resources. Up my surface, 14 and a half years ago, you were saying there weren't all this high-tech stuff. I couldn't even find a single video on YouTube on stroke, not a one. You yeah. know, and now look at what's out there. Anyway, um, yeah, I, I say you break it down and then put the pieces back together now. But it, you know, I, 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 it took me a while to learn that. It, what it, what it took was both in my own recovery and then in helping other people. It took to where we reached a dead end, and I don't like dead ends, so I had to figure out a way. And the way is either to adapt or break down. Those are your choices when you when you when you when you hit a wall. And you should pull one or both of them out of your recovery pockets because they're both real useful useful yep. uh, useful tools. Um, absolutely. And yeah, just to add you got to you got to build from that toolbox and see what resonates because not every tool that I would tell someone is meaningful to them or is it appropriate at the right time, you know, in no, some I'm, of the community. Yeah. That's why I preach you got to become your own uh, patient advocate. You got to become your own physical therapist. You got to become your own nutritionist, your own exercise physiologist. And yep. all these things you have to learn, how, unfortunately, they throw them all at us. Like if you have a heart attack, then join, you go to the local gym where they have the heart attack club and the boys and girls meet like three times a week and walk on the greenway. They don't have anything like that for us. The other thing, I, you know, yep pisses me off is they send us to PT, but they, the, one of the biggest issues in having a stroke is the whole mental aspect and it gets basically ignored. Um, yep. You know, I, if I want to do a little experiment, I'd say, you know, okay, everybody raise your hand who went to PT and everybody will raise their hand. Okay. Now everybody who got assigned to MT met some kind of mental therapy, raise your hand. No one raises their hand. Anyway, um, yeah, yeah, it's important that you you bring that up because that that's one area that you know for those who don't know that some of the advocacy that I've done a lot of early on and I and I absolutely picked up on what you mentioned when I was looking for home resources there was nothing um, a lot of my advocacy work initially was on specific to the my heart defect so I got involved with circles and advocacy around trying to make that patient journey to, to, to PFO closure and supporting life and all the decisions that have to be made around that. You know, I took it to the degree that I ended up testing, testifying before the FDA. So when you talk about empathy, like if I see that something's broken and I, and I know from listening to you, you, you want to fix, like, why hasn't anyone, all these years later, why hasn't anyone, and we're, you know, I can't do this alone. You can't do it alone. I was, you know, I, although I had my blog at No Stroke for, I think I started it the year after. Um, I have hundreds of posts and, and pages and, and the, 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 you know, connecting folks to the right resources became almost a full-time job after I worked, when I got back to work in the clinic. So it does get to a point where you have to take a break and you have to think about your own health too. But one of the things that... Um, I think is, is the ability to have a community and have something, someone to, 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 to um, share that concern with. We, you know, it, it took, I'll, I'll tell you just this story because it took, it took um, me starting to podcast with another co-founder at, at our podcast co-host um, to talk and go to those areas that we knew weren't being talked about. You know, things like, you know, you know, we'll talk about sex or talk about the mental or, or the caregiver side as a young as a young survivor, someone newly married. Like we had folks on our show that um, it actually the, the 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 girl I mentioned is a is now the, the voice of our intro to our No Stroke podcast. And her husband, we had her on early on and then we had her husband back because they were newly married. What, what does that do to a relationship? And what, what is that caregiver thinking about how to support that person? Um, so I think we have to go to those areas is my point in the work and all the videos in the community you're building. Um, we have to, we have to find a way to, you know, obviously the funding is a big part of it. So getting, getting, um, 
getting the resources to build or getting the, the, the base to build the resources. And I know you and I share some of the same um, um, goals. Frustrations. <laughs> yeah, goals frustrations. And, frustrations. And, and why aren't we doing things differently? Um, and why are oftentimes we the ones that folks are coming to looking for those answers or those questions you said is always, I have this type of stroke. Um, I'm this old, how long is it going to take? And will I ever fully recover? I, those are hard questions to answer. And you have, you have to, you know, say, it starts with hope, right? It starts with a plan after that. It starts with building again, back to the athletic thing. It's, it, 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 it starts with having a team and building a team. Um, I can tell you, and I've shared it before that when I had my stroke and I was looking for community at 39 years old, I was referred to a nursing home here in Rhode Island. And that's all that was offered to me from a national association that didn't know where else to send a young stroke survivor who had those questions about, you know, exercise, about, <laughs> you know, life after stroke for someone who was running a business and had three young kids. Yeah, it's um, real different if you're 35 than if you're 75. Just just a it, different but, point of life, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you have your whole life in front of you at 35, not your whole life, but a whole lot more of it than you do it. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, no stroke. And uh, obviously, I'm, uh, I'll share all of your contact information so people can um uh can uh find you um okay one thing i think is you know we got so next week i've got a guy named david grant uh coming on he's built a community he's a tbi survivor he's built a community um uh, it also includes stroke the last five or ten years it has in included stroke survivors in the community so he's got a community of thirty-five thousand people I've got one, you've got one. It seems to me, I don't want to go too far down this, but it seems to me like, you know, we're all wearing the same uniform, but we've got like a whole lot of teams. How do we, yes. get, how do we, you know, at some point, I haven't given up on the healthcare system, but I don't see them doing anything. So I've decided to take a separate road, which is as stroke survivors, if we can't get what we want, then we'll do it for our damn selves. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, th that's, you know, that's kind of the act I've been taking. But, you know, at some point, we need to um, get all these communities um, working together because yeah. um, it's, you know, I've had this, I've been saying this for about five years now. My goal is to build up 100,000 or a million people in a community because at some point, if you have the numbers, they'll have to listen to you. Yeah. You know? That's what so, it's going to take. Yeah. Yeah, so, not to interrupt, but yeah, but amen to that because yeah, I'll I'll I'll. So no stroke yeah. was mostly for me out of my frustration that there weren't resources specifically around life after stroke or the the the, the clouded. I was I was told I was in a gray area for my care. Um, I could go on medical management for the rest of my life, or I knew. I knew I wanted. I knew I wanted to um, get back on hockey skates, and I say this because um, when they wanted me to stay on Kuminen for the rest of my life, I said hockey skates and Kuminen just don't play well together. You've got to give me other choices. I knew. I knew repairing a, a structural defect was an option. It just wasn't approved med from insurance. I knew that it also had a small chance. One of the, you know, everyone's stroke is different, but for me, one of the, in addition to my physical deficits. I, I, I had this, you know, we all have this brain fog and sometimes it just doesn't go away. And when it, if it does clear for me, one of some of my biggest deficits were um, I just had these headaches that would come on and would, you know, we even had a code in my house so that I wouldn't scare my kids. There was a certain hat, a winter hat I put on for my wife when I was in the middle of one of these. And, and this was all months after my stroke. Until until I got my heart uh, defect fixed, um, 
I woke up the next day with a clear head for the first time. Um, mm. And I had my surgery up in Boston and no one's studying this. Like there's a small thing, like what, what does this do to the brain? And, and to me, the stuff I've read is, this is if, if my shunt was open all this time, there's this metabolic junk that's going up to my brain. that's not supposed to be going there. It's too small of a condition for people, for the science. But out of frustration, I started no stroke. And my story eventually got on the cover of the New York Times. And I thought the author was taking a very positive angle. But what he was really doing in the title, and if I was podcasting, and later on, maybe we could, we're going to have you on to build some of this cross community on a show. If I was podcasting up in my studio, you'd see on the back wall that that photo. And the title is a device to avert stroke lacks proof that it works. I knew it was transformational for me and I wasn't not playing doctor with others, but that, that post I was working by myself posting saying, does this matter? You know, am I, you know, I would get people that were coming in and I'm, you know, funny, you should put your story out there. I'm having the exact same thing go on. I can't get people to listen. So that story appeared and then people started reaching out for me from different parts of the country. And we ended up forming the first patient led uh, PFO research foundation. Many folks on the replay, whatever would, would know that building community and, and, and getting the patient perspective out around stroke and PFO years later, that initiative and my stroke blog has grown into a resource that um, I was doing research to see was doing the best work. I had heard that the National Stroke Association was developing an app to help coordinate care. Maybe folks have known of it. This was going back four years ago now. It was called the Comeback Strong app. Um, I And I always say things happen for a reason. And I'm telling this because it, it, it's how I met my co-founder, uh, Michael Garrow, for, that we now podcast. And you'll meet him in another month. Um, he was doing the same research over in Ireland. And again, stroke is a global thing, right? It's just not in your community. Um, he, he had the lived experience. His mom had a stroke in her 20s. So he grew up his whole life seeing the barriers that his mom had experienced. And so we put our brains together and started doing research. Um, and, and then the pandemic hit. So we, again had to pivot and we started podcasting. We put together online programs for folks that were isolated, that were shut down. We did a behavior change program that we just streamed in, on our lunch breaks. And it's still archived on our site, glad to share it. But we're, we're, we've pivoted now to our mission being, we need to educate. And, and some of it, and you mentioned that there are people coming on with a lot of uh, 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 letters after their name. But the most powerful people that come on our show are folks that share that lived experience. We have survivors, we have caregivers, but we also are bringing on some of the, the best guests in the country that we think are doing innovative things that can help transform care, but they're not getting out to the folks that need to hear about them because they're just early on in the lab or their early research, or they're looking for, for, survivors in the community that might want to get involved. And that's honestly, um, I, I learned of you, uh, Ralph, in, in your group through um, someone that we interviewed early on, Brian Harris at MedRhythms, because, you know, uh, music was a big part of my recovery. And later on, I'm going to be on his, his show. Um, so we have to connect, keep connecting these bridges is my point, um, because um, I'm going to be sharing every, all the great work you're doing with my community, when we was doing some early research, um, you mentioned, I met Amy Emmons from Young Stroke out on the West Coast in LA at the International Stroke oh, really? Conference. I didn't yeah. know. That. And, you know, and, and, you know, it was just by way of my neurologist who was also there. He's like, there's someone, I know what you're doing. I know that Amy, let's sit down. I want to introduce you at breakfast. You know, we were doing some early research there around um, you know, the future of stroke recovery being in the home. Um, and we heard some of the leading neurologists, Steve Kramer from UCLA, saying that, you know, the volume just isn't there in the outpatient clinic. He said, if, and he has data to support this. He said, if 
if we look at the time invested for someone to go in clinic, do an episode of care, which sometimes now is cut to 20 to 30 minutes, if you count the reps they're doing, it's 32 on average. It's 32 reps is not enough to drive change. It's enough to, to get you that 10% to be the music coach you mentioned, to tell you what you need to work on when you go home. Yeah. But beyond that, it's not enough time. The stimulus is not high enough. Well, so, I can tell you a number of things that I think they ought to You mentioned the uh, things that they're not looking into. I mean, I can tell you a whole bunch of things that I think they're not looking into. I mean, ultimately, what I'd really like to see happen, and I'm willing to throw in with somebody else, I'm not trying to drive the train. I, I would love it if, but National Stroke Association seemed to have a lot more together than American Heart, American Stroke, but they got bought up by them. And yeah. I'd love to see one of the, one of the big organization like that put us all together under a single umbrella because that's what, what, what it's going to take. Otherwise, we're, you know, we're working yeah. together, but we're still um, fragmented in, yeah. in, in, some, in some sense. But yeah, I just popped this up because you to your point about the NSA, I wrote the, a mobility column for two, two, almost three years for the National Stroke Association, Stroke Sock Magazine. And I was heartbroken when all the, I loved their perspective and I thought they were easier to work with. And then they got bought up. Yeah, same thing, right? It's the worst thing that happened. I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm not here to diss American Heart, American Stroke, but it doesn't seem to exist for our benefit. It's, you know, I mean, it's, it's an outsider. I look in and it looks like a nonprofit that's supporting a bunch of uh, highly paid executives. Um, yeah. You know, sorry to be so cynical, but that's what it looks like to me. So, you know, if if, if the healthcare system isn't going to do it and the organizations that we have, the bigger ones, aren't going to do it, then, you know, it it, it, yeah. it falls back to us, um, which I don't I, think I, is I, fair, I, but then having a stroke isn't fair either. So, you know, you, you play the cards you're, you're dealt with. Uh, there are there are a lot of there are a lot and one I can't take credit for this but the, the, the neurologist we had on the show uh, out of Tufts said there are a lot of boulders in putting your way when you've had a stroke, and 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 for me I interpret it as we have to flip over a lot of rocks to find out what where the barriers are and 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 you know that same app that I that I mentioned that I was trying to flip over rocks on. It was part of the NSA and it was funded and then the American Heart um, bought the rights to that app. And I know how much money was poured into that initial research. And that's sitting in a cubicle somewhere in someone's project now that hasn't got anywhere in two and a half years since that transfer or however long it's been now is before the pandemic. So it's been a while. So Ultimately, there's work I'd to be like, done. Ultimately, I'd like to raise money and do things like... Um, I don't know. I, I don't see any definitive study on spasticity in stroke survivors. Maybe Dr. Hetzler, who has joined us, by the way, knows of one, but I, I, I don't know. I don't know. One seems to me, even if there have been some, they haven't explored it enough. And this is a huge, huge subject for so many stroke survivors uh, in terms of getting moving again, you know, to overcoming yeah. spasticity. Um, if we that's one that's one area and there are so there there are things that and i'll mention too if i could in addition to the podcast sure. it's taken me 16 years i'm writing chapters of my book that are addressing each of these but i'd also and if you can put 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 resources i'm asking for your community's help and your help on this route because through our broadcasting and through our message and growing the podcast we were invited to be part of what's called the Health Podcast Network. And um, we've now moved our podcast over. And one of the unique projects we're gonna be starting myself, Michael Garrow, co-host on the podcast, are gonna be started with this gentleman, um, Dan Kendall from the UK, who has built this Health Podcast Network about their short form podcasts. And we're gonna be working on presenting a series specific around stroke. So we want feedback now. We're in early discovery and we want real voices and we want the um, 
the perspective of that lived experience. And we want to be able to present it in a format that ultimately can be used whether you're 10 years out or you need that initial information and you're sent home at discharge and you have so many more questions than answers. And his podcast series was, you know, his mission was around doing this for other conditions. It's nice and he, talk to people and understand the body. He's, he's bringing us in as uh, uh, wanting to know that he wants to bring our perspective in and get folks in that want to um, share their stories as part of this. So um, it's an early phase. It's a, you know early discovery, but it's something that in terms of, um, you know, providing better aftercare services, it's just one other piece that can be, but, but you're right. We all have to kind of work together to share. We need that million plus user base that is engaged to show just like you mentioned many times, there's 800,000 of us roughly that are sent home every year. To reinvent the wheel. To what's ourselves. next. It makes no sense. No sense. Yes. All right. So, so we right. just keep trying to do something so, about it. Um, I, I want to give you an opportunity to talk about anything else you want to talk about, but also, um, we've been going about an hour yeah, yet. I I wanted to, um, <laughs> if, if you're um, willing to, um, if anybody has any questions, let them also absolutely. ask Yeah, I'd like to. I've, I've been talking long enough, so if anyone has any I questions. I see Christina with a finger up, so but, uh, you got to unmute yourself. Christina, got to click on your audio. There you go. Now you can talk. Oh. Hi, sorry. <laughs> I no, think I, I spoke through okay. it before. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I do have a question. Um, my question is around, um, I'm a PT myself, um, and I had my PFO related stroke four months ago. And I want to get back into exercise. Um, <laughs> and I, I want to get back into living my life. But I've, there's certain habits that I've picked up um, since I had the stroke where I've been having eat, uh, eating a lot of sugar. Um, and I'm worried I'm taking my aspirin and I'm doing all the other things, but I'm just looking for some guidance on how to eat the best way to get back to feeling healthy and how bad is sugar and that, that kind of thing. For the yeah, blood. that's, that's a good, it's Christine, right? Christine. Christina. Yeah. Christina. Thanks for that question. Um, I'll address the, the PFO and the exercise, but also did just, um, refresh. Are you, is your PFO closed or are you waiting or are you, you're, 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 you're moving on with, with just managing on, it, knowing you have it? I'm on a waiting list at the moment. Um, when they did the bubble echo, they just found small, small bubbles. They didn't do, I didn't have to do a valsalva maneuver. They came through on their own. Okay. So it's just a small one, but I'm on the list to be examined and considered for a PFO closure at the moment. Okay. So um, it's interesting you bring up that specific question because all the blog posts that I've tracked over the years, the question about PFO and exercise after a PFO closed or unclosed gets the, the most, the most um, uh, comments and response and question because we don't have, all these years later, we still don't have formal guidelines for that. I mean, my, my cardiologist and my neurologist, their best advice back then was to say, um, if you're crazy enough to want to eventually run a marathon after PFO closure, go ahead and do it. I don't know anyone who's done it yet. But the graduation or the, um, the fuels that you would support, like, like I know in, in many of the clients I work with, gravitate to sugars and, and things that are um, th that our brain sometimes thinks it needs because if we're if we're, we're anxious or we just get away from our normal habit like I was told to stop exercising for me that was the worst thing initially because I'm someone who would wake up every morning and if that was my that was my <laughs> um, drug of choice if you will <laughs> like if I didn't move I got cranky um, so I think they go hand in hand um, I I'm just, I know 
you know, I, I don't like to give out specific advice on diet, but I think a lot of the, the brain science and like moving towards more of a Mediterranean based diet with the, the right, the right oils that we know are healthy for the brain, but just cutting out the junk is the biggest, biggest thing you can do as a first step. And that will put you 80% there. And it's easier said than done, but finding ways to decrease your preference or your brains into, you know, that, you know, there's a reason why they put sugar in anything and all these commercial foods is because they know it's a trigger. They know it's a trigger. Yeah. It's going to keep buying. Um, so I think, um, it, you know, tr training is better supported with, um, you know, you have to, you have to know, we talked about this beginning, you have to have a good awareness of like what's coming in and what's going out, how much energy expenditure, but if you're going back and you're playing, I don't know if you're a manual therapist by training, but, um, you know, I don't think folks know how hard we work during a typical day. We're lifting. If we're truly a manual therapist, yeah. I had to alter my practice and my techniques after and train and, 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 and educate more now as opposed to like trying to fix everything for everyone. I'll tell you how to do the proper setup, how to do your homework properly at home and then come back and test you immediately. And I could tell, and you know this, Christine Parham, you know someone's been doing their homework, right? Or they haven't, oh, yeah. because you'll, you'll ask them to give me a repeat demo of that, uh, you know, modified sit to stand in there. And that's where the video and the stuff you're doing comes in. But I wish I had a, like a, a direct, simple answer on the fuel because it, it, it's, um, it, diet's a hard thing. I, 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 usually, I usually get folks moving and then when they start feeling better, then I say, well, let's start, let's start talking about your diet. And I feel comfortable, pretty comfortable doing that because I, I also have a degree in nutrition. So when people say, well, that's outside your scope of practice, I say, well, not really. That is my scope of practice too. And it doesn't make sense to not address both. I, I don't know if that answered your question or if you had a follow-up. So just one second. I'm just stepping out of the way. We've got builders in the house. Sorry. <laughs> The, the other part of my question, it does answer my question, but what I've found is I, I tried to get off the sugar um, a couple of days ago and my brain, because it's still quite early on since the stroke, it, it struggles to, to cope with not having the sugar. It kind of helps me to stay awake. And, and what is your, can I ask you, I'll ask you a follow-up question to that. What, what is your, what, what is your big, what is, what is your biggest sin in terms of sugar? What is your biggest, what is your, um, what is your go-to sugar bomb, if you will? Um, mint chocolates and crisps mainly, chocolate and crisps. I mean, I'm taking magnesium to try and balance out the cravings i'm trying to sort my electrolytes because i think i'm needing salts as well um okay. but yeah the, the craving is still there it's like i need the energy hit um okay but my brain yesterday i tried to go without the sugar and i was i, felt, I just felt like i was having a meltdown in my brain and I've, I've come off the sugar in the past never a problem before but because my brain's not like it used to be yeah much harder and, and it is, that's important that you mention that because it, it is a, it is a process. You can't go, I hate to use the term cold turkey, but if you stop and you, and it's like, it's, it can, it can be very addicting. And that's why I was wondering, is it like a, is it a, are you getting, is it a crunch thing? Is it a mouthfeel or is it like, if it was simple as like, like, yeah, I'm going a half a liter of Mountain Dew before 12 o'clock. I'd be, you know, we can, you know, it's, I, I always, you know, cause I've, I've worked with, patients that were trying to do that also from not from like an energy brain but also just feeling like they're and maybe you're experiencing this too these major highs you get that dose and then you crash and then it's self you know you just have to keep yeah. it perpetuating you have to keep feeding it with something but um yeah. I, I i would i always start i always i always when i'm looking at someone's nutrition i would say you don't have to record what you're doing forever but and there's plenty of free apps now. I say, write down what you're doing, what you're taking in, and let's work. We can always probably tweak things or make a couple of substitutions. And I'm not, I'm personally not, um, I don't, I, I definitely would rather see you slowly drop your sugar than to do a lot of the sugar substitutes. I think there's there, a lot of these things are on the market are absolutely 
the wrong thing for our metabolism and our brains, but it is a yeah. process. It's not something, if you're going to have lasting change, it needs to be something that you can kind of wean off. But are you, are you back in practice now or are you waiting to get this, to, to um, know what's going on? I'm waiting for um, an electronic bed to arrive, a new electronic bed. And then once that comes in about six weeks, I'm going to try and just start doing a couple of treatment sessions a day just to slowly build back up again. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm not yeah. back at the moment, but I need to, I'm, I'm, I've gained a lot of, well, I've gained four pounds, but I've gained weight and I feel heavy as well yeah. since yeah. I was very tired. So. Yeah, if I, if I could give you any advice returning when you're ready, it has to be on your terms, not when your clinic or I don't know if you're, when they, because they'll throw you right back into your, your volume of patients you need to see. And you'll do no good if you're, if you, if you have a setback. So um, yeah. just pace yourself. I, I'd be glad to talk to you at some other point if you'd like. I don't know if there's, uh, I hope that maybe helped a little bit. I'm not sure. It did. Thank you. Yeah. I've got some good luck good to you. Yeah. Thank you. Christina, a couple of quick things. These are sort of shameless promotion things. But anyway, um, we have a group called Nutrition After Stroke. Um, and we just had a nutritionist join the group, Karina Hines. She's in the Boston area. I don't know if you know her, David. Um, and she's going to um, appear two Tuesdays in, um, in August. So let me get this right. The second, so we have the 9th, the 16th, and the 23rd. She's going to be on August 9th and August 23rd. I'm not exactly sure what we're going to be doing. But I told her the number one thing um, in my mind was um, brain uh, nutrition, the relationship between nutrition and brain health, and also the new relationship between the gut genome and and brain health, because I think that that's a, another area. You want to talk about things that need to get studied more, David? Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> they're they're, they're, they're working on it pretty pretty good. It's not being ignored anymore. It's a, an area of, I think it holds a lot of promise. I think the things that, you know, if we want to talk about tech and everything, I would say that, you know, if we're, the future of stroke recovery is going to become, come from the real positive things in my mind are not going to come from robots. They're going to come from understanding more about how our brain and our bodies work. Mm -hmm. I see you nodding your head. So maybe you, you, yeah. you agree with me. No, um, absolutely. It's, it's a big missing piece right now. And also, you know, well, you those know, subtle, those, go ahead. The, the subtle changes that happen that aren't often measurable with maybe weight on the scale or, you know, or, or movement and mobility, a lot of the, the things that I get excited about are things that unfortunately are already happening in sport performance and even wellness to a degree, but no one's actually bringing that over and talking about the importance. And I'm, gr I'm so grateful. I just happened to come across that you had started that group. So, you know, anything I can do to help support that, I think it's, it's, it, it, it we have to discuss it. We have to, move it up on the, on the, 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 the pyramid in terms of not the food pyramid, but the importance of knowing that brain body and the, you know, the gut relationship is just, it, it, it holds untapped potential. Those of you who don't know the, the gut genome is responsible for producing serotonin and antidepressants are SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, basically hanging on to the serotonin you, you make to keep you happy. So if you can keep your gut genome happy, you're likely to keep your brain happy. Another shameless promotion thing is um, we actually started a group called Wellness After Stroke, and we're looking at um, alternative types of things. And to that end, this Friday, um, Angelia Abbas-Hassan, who's uh, she's, I call them champion. She's a champion of that group. Every group needs a, a, a champion to help drive it and post and whatever. She's going to hold um, the first of what we think might be uh, every Friday um, breathing exercises because you know, I've discovered through yoga, and my daughter's been telling me this for 20 years, she's a yoga teacher, 
about the importance of breathing. So there are a lot of things that we as survivors can introduce into our communities. And so that's one of the things that we're trying to do. Smart. I just put this up here and I'll read it. Um, Cause when everything was shutting down, I smiled as you're saying that not to cut you off, but we talked about smart moves in one of the programs we started for our survivor groups that were all locked out of therapy and we're home trying to figure out what, and I, and our first episode was let's start with breath what you can do is still, we're still breathing, right? And we broke it down and we, we brought in experts that talked about the importance of breath and how it can help inhibit or increase tone. Then we talked about hydrate and move, right? You can still do things, yeah, all day long, right? Yeah, you've already got, the, that's a sign we gotta wrap it up, right? You're, you're ready for your- Oh, no, 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 I do it for Michelle. That was the oh, first time oh. I've actually been able to show Michelle too. She did. She two. did a show, and I did. I managed to finish two glasses, but it didn't get recorded. So now so, it's been recorded. So. It's recorded. So yeah. we we then we talk about you talked about the importance of humor and smiling is the third thing on list. Share that goes to the community building. Talk right. about what's on your mind. Bring bring that back so that you can hear that it's going to be okay, and that you can maybe at the time that you're feeling your worst, if you help someone else out that that can make all the difference in your your the kind of day you have and then the fat the final you'll see a couple of little hash marks and you see the fast the, the longest is because we didn't know how long cobra was going to drag on it said rest rinse and repeat it might be days it might be weeks and i initially started scratching off the weeks until it turned into months and then i gave up on the scratches because i didn't have a backside. but basically all those things play into our our being right and and the 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 way that our day is shaped. And, and when we didn't have any resources and my clinic was just shut down as well. Um, and that's when I turned and kind of really went to virtual care full-time and then realized how you can scale it. So the stuff you're doing with video, we just all have to put our brains together and keep growing it and continue to turn over rocks until we, you know, we, we, we get that, that, uh, that point where we're heard and and um i you mentioned you have folks on if i can just wrap them say look i'm going to continue this conversation on friday with brian harris on brain with brains with brian okay. and on a show um i'm going to be doing a deeper dive onto the music side i talked about my gate and my recovery a lot of the songs and things that i hacked i will probably talk about i mentioned i was a early uh, I wrote a column for National Stroke Association, and one of them was about stepping up our rehab. And it's a perfect example that shows where in a short period of time we've come with the technology because I, I talk about what you would need to use to inter introduce rhythm into your, um, into your workout back then. I said, you had to get a metronome. You had to download Audacity, which was a free program that you could overlay music and put a rhythm. I knew it resonated with me. Fast forward, there's innovators and folks that have also dove into the science of why that works. Um, and you've had multiple conversations with Brian and his team around that. So I think we just all have to, you know, find a way. And maybe maybe it sounds like you you have the, the lead on this. Well, we have to keep feeding feeding resources into your community till we build a bigger voice. I think someone might have a question. Thank you. I have a question for David. What is PFO? Uh, so what is a what is a PFO? Is a question? Yes. Yeah. Good, great, great question. Um, a PFO is an acronym for Peyton Foramen Valley, and it refers to, um, without getting too technical, there's a wall in the atrial septum that, at your first breath, when you when you um, start to breathe on your own as a newborn, that's supposed to close. And a certain percentage of the population is debate whether or not it's size 25%, that defect doesn't close. Um, when, 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 and for some people live their entire life, never have, but when, when, um, when they re determine it to be pathological, oftentimes um, one of the other, uh, Christina had mentioned, I believe that she had some diagnostic tests uh, when it's determined that that's probably shunting and causing, you have to rule out other things like AFib and, um, you know, if there's any other um, cardiometabolic risk factors. 
but in my case, I had no, no other known risk factors. Um, and when they dove in and, and looked at my heart, they saw that my heart defect was the reason that um, they, they determined it a pathological PFO, that it was the reason and because they could prove blood was passing up to the other chamber of the heart that made it a direct escape route. Normally in normal circulation, small microclots, and I don't know if this is getting too technical, are usually filtered out um, by, our, by our lungs. In the case of a defect like a PFO, it bypasses and all these microemboli go up to the brain and can, depending on where they go in the, in the circulation, they, they can lead to um, a stroke. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else got one? And Dr. Hetzler's getting a uh, hydration refill. <laughs> Thank you for observing that. Yes, my wife always brings that to me. <laughs> She's a good <laughs> woman. We all know that. Um, well, it reminds me to drink at least it's not drinking alcohol. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, alcohol actually dehydrates you. I've never understood that, but I'm willing to believe the science. I believe in science. So I have to. I used uh, to say, I used to say I'm a workaholic. The more I work, the more I drink. <laughs> <laughs> that could be said of a lot of us, especially if you don't like to work. But um, so um, I guess we'll wrap this up, David. Uh, what can I say? Except yeah. we could have talked for about four hours or, <laughs> or 40 hours. But, well, um, I could, I, I'm, I'm losing my connection. It's saying I'm stable. So I'm hoping this is a good timing to wrap. I just hope that we can continue this conversation, Ralph, if you still hear me. In a couple of weeks, we have you booked just to continue the conversation. You're going to be a guest on the North Stroke podcast. So we'll definitely continue this conversation and put our continue to bring our brains together. Right. And I'll actually, it's interesting you, that you, um, that you said that because putting our brains together is my series, uh, similar to Brian's, uh, brains with Brian, um, yeah, Brian said putting our heads together. And I said, ah, you know, I get the whole thing about the familiarity and I just substituted brains and I, I liked it anyway. Yeah. We'll keep putting our brains together. I'll see if I can't tune in. What time is that on Friday? It's same time we started. It's 11 East, East Coast time. Uh, it's yeah. 11, 11 a.m. I'm, if doing not, the, uh, I'm doing that thing, yeah. breathing thing with Angel, Angelia. Yeah. I didn't know better. I might have scheduled it differently. But 11 o'clock is a good time for these meetings because it's 8 o'clock on the West Coast and 5 o'clock in Europe. So you kind of hit yep. the, 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 the biggest um, audience. That's, that's exactly. Yep. We'll keep we'll keep uh, this conversation going. I'll put all links to No Stroke and all your contact info information in there. And uh, when I appear on your show, I'll I'll post it in, yep. in all the groups. Not for my ego, yeah. but because we're likely to talk it, about some things yeah. that hopefully will benefit but people. And, and yeah, so you're more than welcome back here anytime. I'm going to introduce you, you. Um, to. Um, Mitch also, um, because um, Mitch is a big believer in play. In fact, that's how Mitch and I connected. I have an OT friend here in, in Myrtle Beach area who's a big believer in play. And Mitch uh, posted about anybody believe in play and in therapy. And I'm the only one who commented on it. And you do also. So <laughs> I'm going to make sure yeah. I'm also going to send you, a, I like Yogi Berra. I've used a couple of his quotes, like uh, he has a quote, um, baseball is 90% uh, mental and the other half is physical. Of course, that adds up to 140% and makes a yogiism because it doesn't make sense. So I just <laughs> change baseball to stroke. It works perfectly. And I have another Perfect. one. I haven't, you said uh, stones in our way to overturn the boulders. I have another one. Yogi said, if you come to a fork in the road, take it. Well, I made up another meme. I happen to know of a, um, a fork in the road in Milan, uh, spelled like Milan, Italy, Milan, New York, where a guy actually built a 30-foot tall fork. So uh, my daughter lived there. I got a picture of it. 
You got I it. Made up thing. another uh, Yogi meme, so I'll send that that to you. And Please do. You to um, Mitch, put all your uh, contact info um, and anything else you want uh, under Perfect. the YouTube video. You know how it works. So anything. Yeah. Else? Yeah. I'll send you a link it, once it's up, and you can tell me if there's anything else you want to add. And you're perfect. welcome back here any old time you want. You want to you. on a, a, any subject. And, and uh, I just uh, I just joined your stroke community, so thanks for letting me in. Um, right, I let you in. It, yeah. So I'm, if anyone wants to reach out, I'm not the best at interacting day to day on Facebook, but if anyone does have any follow up questions, um. I, I'll, I'll probably send my information over if they will. In the short term, the, the fastest route is the way I think you reached out to me. Um, the contact form on No Stroke, I get those right away through my email because I don't have like, I don't have the Facebook app connected on my phone. I have to do the whole login. I just, I find that I'm more productive during the day to just, just, you know, check my email. So if anyone wants to reach out, has questions we didn't get to, or, or in the group, I, I'll certainly, now that I'm in, I'll, I'll, I'll make a note to jump in and, and join the discussion. So thank Great. you all. Great. And I'll send you a link to the nutrition group. And uh, Perfect. Christina, oh, Chris, Christina, if you want to send me a message uh, on Facebook, I'll, I'll um, point you to the uh, nutrition and the wellness group. Yes, Perfect. Please. So we'll wrap Thank it you, up. everyone. We're going to wrap it up. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you again, David. And next week, we got David Grant on his um, community that he's built. And then we have Karina Hines. And then we have um, Lisa Piano and I are going to do the thing on adapting. Then Karina Hines comes back. And then I'm open for the rest of my life. But <laughs> something will come along. Uh, right, Michelle? Oh, you come the voice comes up. <laughs> So well, just in time, just in time to be on our show, Ralph, it sounds that'll take you into August at some point. So there you, there you go. go. Yeah. <laughs> well, I do something every Tuesday because if I found out if you don't do it every Tuesday, uh, people don't know what to expect. The more consistency yeah. you can have with your podcast or your Zoom, uh, the more you can uh, expect to build an audience. So thanks to again, David. Thank you, everyone. To everybody. Um, for uh, coming, and uh, I hope you got something out of it. I know I did. Thank you, everyone. Great day. Thank you.